This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. The Trump administration is reportedly considering plans to resume its policy of forcibly separating children from their parents along the U.S.-Mexico border, even as the full number of people torn apart the last time it carried out the widely condemned practice remains unclear. A new report by Amnesty International suggests immigration officials separated some 6,000 families between April and August, a far higher number of children and parents torn apart than previously thought. On on Friday, The Washington Post reported senior White House adviser Stephen Miller is advocating for tougher measures in response to thousands of parents with children who continue to seek asylum in the United States after fleeing violence in Honduras, Guatemala and El Salvador. Miller said the separations were an effective deterrent. On Saturday, President Trump said he agreed. If they feel their separation, in many cases, they don't come. But also, in many cases, you have really bad people coming in and using children. They're not their children. They don't even know the children. They haven't known the children for 20 minutes, and they grab children, and they use them to come into our country. You got some really bad people out there. We're doing an incredible job. But the one thing I will say, the country is doing so well economically and every other way that more people want to come in than ever before. Trump administration officials are now considering plans to detain asylum-seeking families together for up to 20 days, then force parents to choose to either stay detained together for months or years while their immigration case proceeds, or allow their children to be taken to a government shelter where their relatives or others can seek custody. This comes as an Associated Press investigation has revealed parents who are deported from the U.S. after being separated from their children may lose their children to adoption without their knowledge. The AP found holes in the system that allow for state judges to put children of deported Central American immigrants in the custody of U.S. families without notifying the parents. Meanwhile, a tent city in the desert outside El Paso, Texas, that was set up to hold migrant children, has expanded its capacity by nearly 10 times since it opened in June and now has the capacity of nearly 4,000 beds. For more, we're joined by Lee Gallant, deputy director of the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project, the lead lawyer on the ACLU's national challenge to the Trump administration's family separation <coughs> practice, also presented the first challenge to President Trump's travel ban order, known as the Muslim ban. His argument resulted in a nationwide injunction. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. It's great to have you with us. We've been trying for a while. I know you've been <laughs> traveling back and forth around the country, particularly in California, where you right. were intimately involved with the negotiations um, around getting these kids back together with their parents right. to meet the judge's deadline. Right. But many were not brought back we together. We still haven't got them all back. And what are the numbers? You know, the numbers are shifting because the government's numbers are shifting. We believe there is somewhere between 100 and 200 kids who still need to be reunited. And that's the crazy thing about it, is that they are talking about a new family separation policy, haven't even got all the children back together from the first separation policy. These kids are so traumatized, little children are going to be potentially permanently traumatized, and now they're talking about it having new family separation. There is going to be such an outcry, just like there was the first time, maybe bigger. We'll be back in court. I mean, I, I cannot believe that they're actually talking about another family separation. How is it possible to do it? I mean, after you have the judge's ruling, they have to be <clears throat> reunited. Isn't this defying the courts? Well, so what they're going to do is tweak it a little bit and say, this is different. Whatever they want to call it, we'll be back in court. And what about Amnesty's numbers saying, right. in fact, 6,000 families were right. separated? We have been concerned for a while that there may have been more families separated than the government was revealing. I don't know whether I, you know, Amnesty's numbers are exactly correct or not. We'll, ha we'll have to see. What we're waiting for is the government to respond. All the government's doing is sort of categorically denying and saying it's inaccurate. We need more specifics, and we will keep pressing the government. On, on those specifics and, and wait to see. Uh, we have no reason to distrust Amnesty's numbers, but we'd like to see the government respond specifically to them. Mm -hmm. So you talk about, for example, the hundred, several hundred right. children right now. So where are they? They are in government facilities in the U.S. The biggest bulk, what we've been fighting now for about eight weeks, is they deported roughly 400 parents without their children. So those parents are all over the world, largely in Central America. So we have been trying to track those parents, to find them, to ask them, 
what do you want to do? These are your legal options. And I was in Guatemala a few weeks ago talking to some of the parents. It's an agonizing decision, because the government's saying we won't bring the parents back. We're going to still try and get the parents back. But if they can't come back, they're having to make this brutal decision. Do I leave my child in the U.S. to pursue asylum and keep them safe, or do I bring them back and reunite them? And about two-thirds of the parents are leaving their children in the U.S., which goes to show you just how dangerous it is there. And conservatives are saying, well, look, these parents don't even care about their children. They're abandoning them. Nothing could be further from the truth. When I looked in these parents' eyes, they are have such agony making this decision, but they say to me, I can't bring my child back here. It's just too dangerous. I'm old. My life's over. If I'm killed, I'm killed. But I can't bring my child back here. I want to go to a top Health and Human Services official who told lawmakers at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that he'd repeatedly warned the Trump administration against separating immigrant families at the border. This is Jonathan White, commander of the Public Health Service Commission Corps, a branch of HHS. White referred to OR, O-R-R, which stands for the Office of Refugee Resettlement. During the deliberative process over the previous year, uh, we raised a number of concerns uh, in the ORR program about uh, any policy which would result in family separation uh, due to uh, concerns we had about the best interest of the child as well as about whether that would be operationally supportable with the bed capacity we had. During the hearing, Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal also questioned Jonathan White about the psychological impact of separating children from their parents. Separation of children from their parents entails significant risk of harm to children. Well, it's traumatic for any child separated from his or her parents. Am I correct? I say that as a parent of four children. There's no question. There's no question that separation of children from parents entails significant potential for traumatic psychological injury to the child. Despite Jonathan White's testimony, a top official with ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, tried to defend the Trump administration's practice of separating kids from their parents, comparing the child detention facilities to summer camp. This is Matthew Albentz, head of enforcement and removal operations for ICE. I think the best way to um, describe them is to be more like a summer camp. These individuals have access to 24-7 food and water. They have educational opportunities. They have recreational opportunities, both structured as well as unstructured. There's basketball courts. There's exercise classes. There's soccer fields that we put in there. A veritable summer camp. Right. I, I think when we see the administration's own kids going to those summer camps, we'll know that they're really summer camps. But I'm so glad you played that, that clip of Commander White talking about the trauma, because in some ways, it's just starting, or the next phase is just starting. These kids are so badly, and the government's doing nothing to provide trauma relief. We are going to try to get doctors to see all these children pro bono. But the children, I mean, when I talk to a mother who had a four and 10 year old separated, the four year old just keeps asking her, now that they're reunited, are they going to come and take me away again? I mean, that's the vulnerability that's set in for all these children. The government's trying to stop the, or expand the 20 day limit on parents and kids right. that right. are imprisoned. Right. So what they're, they're basically saying is, oh, you have a choice. You can keep your child with you in essentially immigration jail, or you can lose your child and let your child go out. I mean, that's no choice at all, right? And so the government knows very well they have another choice, which is to release the family under supervision, even if they want to take the harsh step of putting ankle bracelets on. The Trump administration abandoned the, the Obama administration's use of a program that was 97 percent effective in assuring appearance. And now they're saying the only choice we have is to keep them in immigration jail or to separate. That's absolutely wrong. They can release these asylum-seeking families under supervision. What do they face? You were in Guatemala. What are <clears throat> these kids and families facing? Why a parent would make the excruciating decision to remain separated from their child um, because they fear for their child's yeah. lives? I mean, absolutely. So take this one father we went to see. We said, we want to come see you. We'll see you any time during the day. He said, I can't get off work. We said, fine, we'll come at night. He said, no, the gangs close down the town, have a curfew. I'm not allowed out of my house. You certainly can't come here. I mean, that's the kind of danger these families are in. What, what parent would willingly give up their child? They are making the kind of decision that no parent should ever have to face.
So you were in San Diego a lot, right. uh, negotiating with the government. And in court, right. And, and in court, right. trying to meet this, uh, <clears throat> make the government meet this deadline right. to release the mm -hmm. children, the first set under five and then uh, the others uh, going up into their teen years. Um, what wasn't the government giving you, and what have they even admitted now they didn't, when it came to giving information that would connect the parents from their kids? Yeah. Information, in fact, they had, but said, you go look for it yourself. Exactly. So it was like pulling teeth every single step. So the first step was, look, <coughs> we don't have—they actually said in court, we don't have a budget item to bring the kids back to their parents. They had a budget item, of course, to separate them. The judge said, Absolutely not. These parents are not paying to get their own children back. Then when we said, we can't find these parents without information, they said, no, you go find them. The judge said, absolutely not. It turns out that they had phone numbers for the parents. We're driving around Central America looking for the parents. They were sitting on the phone numbers. Finally, we have the phone numbers. We are calling the parents. All but 10 of the parents, at least as of the last report, have been reached, but only because we have had to do this legwork. What has to happen now, Lee? Well, I think all the children have to come back. We'd like to see the children get relief. We'd like to see the children get fair asylum proceedings. And we certainly don't want to see more separations. And we don't want to see a substitute for family separations be long-term, indefinite detention of these families. The medical community has said if you detain these families, it will cause severe harm to the children, long-term detention. We don't put four-year-olds in long-term detention in this country. Or um, I saw Ivanka Trump uh, interviewed. <clears throat> mm -hmm. She said the family separation was the low point of the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she's not just the president's daughter, but she is a senior advisor yeah. to the president. Yeah. And now the president, once again, even with hundreds of children still separated from their parents, saying that they're going to separate them again. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, anybody who was opposed to it hopefully spoke out at the time. I mean, people need to speak out in real time and stop it not after the fact. I, I cannot believe that the administration is thinking about going back to this. I mean, this is the only place the administration has ever pulled back, and that's because of the public outcry. I'm urging the public to have that same outcry if they try it again. That's what's critical. We'll, the ACLU will be in court, but the public outcry is critical. One of the things that President Trump continually said is they've got to come over the border <laughs> legally. We right. went to the border. We went on the bridges. <clears throat> mothers with their two-year-old children, day after day in the hot, blazing sun, not being allowed, which was the Trump administration being illegal, breaking federal and, and international law, not allowing them into the country. Oh, absolutely. And so, first of all, the lead plaintiff in our case presented herself lawfully at the border, did not cross illegally, and that she had her child taken and many others. So the narrative they were putting out was simply wrong. But now they've said, go to a port of entry, you're absolutely right. The lines are endless. People are sitting out there with their little children. Ultimately, they have no choice but to cross where they can choice. They're not going to sit out there for a month with a three-year-old. It's absolutely horrendous what's going on. Who would force the administration to uh, engage in lawful activity? Who well, can do that? I, I think it's going to have to be the courts, but I think, like all big civil rights cases, it has to have that public outcry around it. There has to be this atmosphere. And I think what you saw in the summer is the public pushing back, not just liberals and Democrats, but conservatives and Republicans saying, look, in the United States, we just don't do this to children. If the administration is going to do it again, we have to see that public outcry again. We have to. Lee learned is deputy director of the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project, lead lawyer for the ACLU's national challenge to the Trump administration's family separation practice. He presented the first pre uh, challenge to President Trump's travel ban order, known as the Muslim ban, uh, the, his argument resulting in a nationwide injunction. This is Democracy Now! Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of El Salvador, has been declared a saint by the Pope, will go to British Columbia to speak with the author of Assassination of a Saint, what happened on March 24, 1980, in El Salvador, the killing of an archbishop, and what was the U.S. role in that? Stay with us.